Peace be with you. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and it is my great pleasure to be joining you today to share with you the Word of God in this online Bible study uh, held on uh, Sunday, November 8th, 1015 between services. We do this every Sunday now since uh, we have been distancing with COVID and coronavirus. We do have in-person Bible studies also at Zion on Tuesdays at 9 a.m. and Thursdays at 7 a.m. The Thursday 7 a.m. study is for men, a Bible study and breakfast, and the Tuesday morning 9 a.m. study is for everybody, but no breakfast. And I guess there's not breakfast right now at the 7 a.m. either because we're not serving food, again, as part of the, the COVID uh, care that we are taking. So we have this study on Sundays at 10.15 for you every week, and we have been working through the question, what is so good about being a Christian? Why does it make life better? Sometimes from the world's perspective, it makes life worse. There is a quote from the ancient world in which one uh, fellow says uh, about Christ uh, that all the followers of Christ all look like they're mourning. They all look like they're in perpetual grieving. And a more modern scholar once said in the 1800s, uh, he said, Christ opened his mouth and turned the world gray. Uh, sometimes people experience Christianity as making life worse because what Christianity does is it creates a hierarchy of values. I think it's fair to call it that a hierarchy of priorities in which we do not take as much uh hedonistic joy in the world as the world does. We are more moderate in our approach to the world. We are also more willing to let the world go. Um, and we also are very aware of our sin. But in the midst of that, grieving for our sin, grieving for the world that's passing away, is the knowledge that there's a new creation coming, that sins are forgiven, that Christ is present with us, and that the Christian faith gives us a whole new way to live that makes life better, that makes life filled with joy and with strength and peace. So we have been exploring that. And this Sunday, the, the topic is presence, not space, which may seem kind of like a rather, I don't know, heady sort of brainy um, sort of title. But what it's getting at is this. Uh, we have, I think, I think more and more as the scientific worldview shapes the minds of our young people, shapes our minds, uh, those of us who are older, uh, we have this vision of an empty universe, right? This reminds me of that video by Carl Sagan that is shown in class in public schools and and other institutions across the, the nation, and it's shown to young people all the time. Uh, Carl Sagan shows this image of the Earth. I believe, I believe it starts close up on the Earth and then draws farther and farther back so that we see how small Earth is. And maybe it starts far away and then gets closer, but I think it's one of those two. And as the camera does that, Carl Sagan, a renowned atheist, talks about how the earth is so small, the earth is so insignificant. Everything that is so dear and valuable to us occurs on this little earth, and this little earth is so lonely in the universe and so very small. And that view of the universe then tends to paint the creation as a bit cold, a bit empty. One of the points that, that atheists often make is something like how can we think we're the center of the universe here on earth and that it's all about us like christian christianity seems to say that god created this one world for all of us when we see how vast and large the universe is and of course the counter argument is well how can we not think that when we see how vast and large the universe is and how unique the earth is in the universe it used to be said among scientists that it is likely that there is life elsewhere now they've modified that a little bit, and they've said, if there are places like Earth, it is likely that life is elsewhere. <laughs> because they keep looking and they keep not finding any place like life, or like Earth, which can sustain life. And uh, sure, you know, saying that we found extraterrestrial life, and it turns out to be a, uh, 
an amoeba or not even that some microscopic you know something uh three three thousand layers under the crust of some giant plant i mean what is what are we talking about at this, this point right so and i'm not saying that there's not extraterrestrial life i'm not getting into that question really um i mean christians kind of have an open mind about the wonders of god's creation so we're not saying that uh, we're not closing the book on some of these questions in the church but certainly we believe what is spoken to us in scripture that the universe was indeed made out of the lord out of the lord's great love in order to uh proclaim his wonder and his glory and that he sets us within this creation to know that glory and that wonder and to rejoice in it and so therefore we come to the christian perspective which does not look at the earth as empty and cold but looks at or the universe as empty and cold but looks at the universe as being filled with a presence and i really want to emphasize this with you especially if you have any access to children at all if you have access to children at all, understand, please, that their worldview, as it's being shaped in scholastic settings, is a worldview, and in, and in cultural setting, settings generally, uh, is a worldview that just views everything as empty out there, as vast and cold and dark. It is conditioned by space. You've probably heard me say this before. I think I've even said it in the course of this study. The, uh, the movie from the 1950s, Rebel Without a Cause, uh, is very illustrative. I think it's very helpful for understanding what's going on in the minds of young people still today. It begins with this field trip to an observatory as all of these high schoolers, you know, laconic, sort of uninterested, lay back in these chairs, um, bored out of their minds in a way but very placidly receiving the message that one day the earth will and the whole universe will simply explode and become nothing once more and that that's the future the future is one of just being nothing and that is indeed the vision of the future that is conditioning so many young people's minds it's a vision marked by absence marked by space marked by emptiness the Christian worldview is very different. In the Christian worldview, we look at everything, even the galaxies, even the stardust of the universe as being soaked with presence. So let's talk about the presence of God as we find it This uh, in, in Holy Scripture. Remember, we do this in three ways in this study, creation, salvation, sanctification, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We look at three different ways three different categories loosely made uh, to look at how this makes life better. Also, I have two things I want to make sure I don't forget. So, I don't know, someone put a little message down there to remind me to tell you two things at the end of this. One about presence, one about uh, the study next week. All right, so um, we go to Genesis chapter 2 to an oft-overlooked little verse. Genesis chapter, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, we'll go to 3 because uh, for the sake of time, and we're going to look at the point where Adam and Eve have sinned, and God knows about it, and they have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and here's what we, here's what happens afterwards. Then the, this is verse 7 in chapter 3, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Think about that. They hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Uh, God's walking in the garden with them in the cool of the day. Now, I, I, let's just take that for what it says, okay? God's moving among humankind in the garden. Uh, if there's some sort of metaphoric dimension to walking, I don't know what it is. I don't know uh, how God metaphorically is walking, okay? It says what it says. 
uh, God is this close and present to Adam and Eve. And we see what that presence does to Adam and Eve. It frightens them. Why does it frighten them? Because they have sinned. And so they hide themselves from God. This helps us understand what all that space talk is talking about, what all that distance, emptiness, vision uh, is talk is why that's there. There is something fearful about the presence of the Lord for mortals like us. The presence of the Lord by itself is not immediately a cause for happiness among humankind. And that is why humankind might make it or might find it more comforting to make God absent, to make the universe empty. Because if there is this presence of our creator, a presence of one who has made us an infinite love, then something happens to us, especially when we are conditioned by sin. And what happens to us is that we are made immediately accountable to this presence. It demands our attention. And if we have a presence of infinite love demanding our attention, and calling us to immediate accountability and acknowledgement, then suddenly what will happen is that we'll become very aware of how we are not loving. This is, a this is where Paul talks about falling short of the glory of God in Romans. But nevertheless, while that may be how we experience the presence of God in the first case, it doesn't diminish the fact that he is indeed present. That the garden in the beginning, created for Adam and Eve, was also created for God. It was created to be a place where he would have, to use older language, concourse with, um, with man and woman. He would have conversation and fellowship with man and woman. He have a concourse, like at an airport. It's a place where um, that connects one thing to another, right? one place to another. God has concourse with man and woman. He is connected to them by this garden in this garden. And so the garden is a place filled with the Lord's presence. And that should signal to us from the very beginning what God intends for this whole creation, right? This is what God intends for the whole creation, ultimately, for the whole creation to be drenched with his presence. Just think about that. Think about what that does for your life and for your vision of the world. How suddenly the world becomes, as we've said before in this study, a little bit friendlier. The world becomes a little bit safer even when you're dying or when you're hurt. Because we can expect then that even in the midst of the dying and the hurt, God is present. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here. That's the power of the cross. For God to enter even into the pain and to be present with us in the pain and for us to trust that presence and to trust that it, it is good. But as I said, in the, in the first instance, when we hear that God is present, we might think this is bad news. Let's get God out of here um, because this, this God is um, you know, making me think, feel badly about myself. Or this God is making me afraid of the future or whatever it is. Uh, because of who I am. So let's unpack a little bit more why God's presence is good. It makes me think, actually, as I'm talking about that, of a uh, moment back in the 1990s, ages ago, when there was a, a debate going on uh, in the Lutheran Church about one thing or another. And the way that people talked about this online at that time was not through sort of chat forums or, what, or tweeting or whatever it is now, but they use listservs, which is just email lists. And you would send out a, a comment through email to everybody on this email list. And this one guy was doing that, a friend of mine was doing that and talking about uh, Christ's salvation. And this other man was, was taking him to task about Christ being a savior of any kind and not thinking that that was a very important dimension of Christ. And finally, my friend said to him, in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. And suddenly the emails from the other guy stopped coming. <laughs> and then a little bit later, 
the last email came and it was, you're crazy. And then the guy never said another thing again, right? You're crazy. And so what's happening, you know, there, again, it's just it's an indication how the presence of the Lord, you know, if we think of the Lord being present in that word, I forgive you all your sins. And it's a good word, nevertheless, was experienced as idiocy and something to avoid, something to leave alone. So let's unpack more why the Lord is a good presence to have near us. For this uh, development, we're going to begin in the Psalms. And just a verse here, uh, just one little verse, Psalm 24, there's others we could use, but Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Now, the, what I want you to see there is a couple things. One, the fullness of the earth, not just the earth thought about in sort of abstract terms as a circle or the land sort of just generally, but the fullness thereof, the seeds germinating in the ground, the insects around the seeds, the life in the seed, the life that comes out of the seed, uh, the sun that's shining on the ground, um, all the inhabitants of the earth, the fullness of the earth is the Lord's. It is in his hands, okay? We all are possessed by him. We belong to him. And then it adds this, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And we just think, well, that just means, yeah, it's his because he made it. But there's something more being said there because oceans and rivers are what? They're water. They're viewed as a source of flooding. They're viewed as a source of chaos. So the Lord has established the earth and the fullness thereof upon chaos itself. He has actually bent chaos, as it were, to his control in order to establish, not that chaos is a thing, but he's, he's, he's blown into chaos and blown open chaos and established a good earth and source of life for us in the midst of all this chaos. This shows not just that God is present, but he's present for the sake of our good. The, one of the terms for this in the Christian faith is imminent, imminent, not imminent, as in something's about to happen, it's imminent, but imminent, um, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T, I believe, um, he is present and close for the sake of working for you, for the sake of doing goodness for you. He's establishing a good earth upon chaos, upon the seas and the rivers, this source of the flood. And then we go forward to Isaiah chapter 6. This is, this is what I'm living for. What you're about to hear is what I am living to see. Uh, and may God grant it. He's promised, so I'll hold him to it. Verse 1, chapter 6 in Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, High, this is Isaiah, the actual prophet Isaiah saw this. Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. So here we have a vision of God granted to the prophet Isaiah in the actual temple in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And uh, this, is, this is a stunning moment. Uh, prophet Isaiah, who's also a priest, is in the temple, perhaps doing priestly duties. And suddenly the earth is shaking. God is on a throne in the midst of the temple. His robe is like this glorious light filling the temple. Uh, heavenly beings are flying over him. 
and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The glory of the Lord is not just a heavenly glory that we long to see, but, but, the, but, the, but the glory of the Lord actually fills the earth. We need to think about what that means. What does it mean for this glory of God to fill the earth? But then we get an insight as to what it might mean when we see Isaiah's response and how, how God deals with it. Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips. See, the presence of the Lord makes him afraid. The presence of the Lord makes him initially aware of how bad he is. But how does God deal with it? He sends the seraphim to take a burning coal, touch it to his lips, and say, your sins atone for and you are clean. This is a profound insight into the character of our Father, of our Lord and God, that he indeed exposes how we are unclean, but then he takes it away. He does what's necessary so that we may dwell with him as clean people. That should tell us what the glory of the Lord is. It's the glory of serving his creation. It's the glory of serving his people. That's what the earth is full of. The earth is full of God's intent that you be served and cared for. And that's how then he invites us to look upon the earth. Uh, o worship the king, all glorious above is a hymn that has a stanza that goes something like, your bountiful care, what tongue can recite, it breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It, um, your bountiful care, what tongue can recite, it breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It, something on the hills, descends to the plains and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. And so um, it, the idea is that the, the hills, the valleys, the dew, the rain, the air, and the sunshine themselves are the glory of God because they're the glory of, they are his handiwork created so that you may breathe, have light, eat, drink, be refreshed. This is the glory of the Lord that fills the heavens and the earth. And so we are, to, what we are developing really is a sacramental view of the whole earth. Again, rather than view ourselves as cold, empty, uh, absent here in this creation, there is a profoundly kind, good presence with us in this creation, working through the creation itself to care for us, and therefore we experience his presence in that care. Of course, it can be misunderstood, it can be absconded by natural disaster and by the death that follows upon natural disaster, but as a professor of mine liked to point out, if you weren't a sinner, a tornado couldn't kill you. So really, the tornado is not the problem, it's sin. Rather good point, actually. If you weren't a sinner, the flood couldn't kill you. And so, since floods are killing us, the problem is not the flood, the problem is our sin. <laughs> uh, really brilliant, and a good insight, and, um, and, and sets us up, then, for understanding how we still believe in this presence, and still rejoice in this presence, as we turn to the New Testament and start shifting more from creation and the presence of God in creation to the presence of God in Jesus Christ. For that, we go to Colossians chapter 1, where he talks about who Jesus is, St. Paul does, in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians was a letter that likely was read by other places besides Colossae, more of a circular letter, and that's probably why it passed into Holy Scripture. When we begin at verse 15, we see St. Paul writing the following about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I've shared this passage with you uh, in other respects during this study, but in this particular part, in this particular part of the study, what I want you to see is this phrase at the end of verse 19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. 
and through this Jesus then to reconcile all things to himself. So Jesus not only has the fullness of God dwelling within him, but through this Jesus, all things now are going to hold together and be reconciled to each other in creation. So we come to God, God comes to us uh, in the midst of many problems, our sin uh, and therefore a dangerous creation and therefore uncertainty about the presence of God. Is it good? Is it bad? And God deals with that problem by putting his presence in Jesus, who then suffers all of our sin, suffers all the uncertainty of creation, uh, that is, suffers the cause of that uncertainty and his death upon the cross. And through him, uh, by making him one of us, by casting him into our lot, actually returns all those things to God and shows God's power to work even through the broken, the sinful, the evil, the wrong, to accomplish his good and gracious purpose. This is why Martin Luther would talk about fleeing from the Father to the Son. We flee from the Father to the Son, because when we go to the Father by himself, sort of naked, if you will, then he's very frightful. Oh my word, I don't match up to this God. He has expectations. He holds me accountable. I'm not sure what he's doing in creation. Is it for my good or is it for my ill? Go to Christ crucified, who rose from the dead, and you have your answer. There is where the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. There is where all things hold together. This is a point also made in Ephesians. So when we go to Ephesians chapter 1, there it is. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to start reading at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So it begins with that union with heaven, saying we've been blessed in Christ in the heavenly places, even though we are earthlings, we have been blessed in Christ in the heavenly places. Why? Because Christ has ascended, and so he's up there with God. But at the same time, everything's united in him. Uh, he is, it were, takes everything with him. Everything is near him. Everything is present to him, even in heaven. Because, of course, by his flesh, by his blood, he has spanned the distance. He has even gone to the grave and reclaimed the grave. And so in his flesh, in his blood, um, Everything is present, sort of like, you know, the earth of a place is present in its cheese or in its wine or in its food. And then we go to another point in Ephesians. I think I'm maybe getting a little bit long here, but um, someone just knocked, so I may have to go in a little bit. But um, here at the end of chapter 1, Verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Beautiful language. Let me read that again. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus is the fullness. He fills all in all. And yet the church is filled with him and he's filled with the church. And so he's present to the church. The church is present to him. They are not separated. There is no space. There is presence. And then this sets us up very nicely for that great, beautiful gift of the church, the holy sacrament of the Lord's body and blood, on the altar, on the hands of the pastor, on your lips, on your tongue, in your flesh and your soul. Because if God indeed is present to all his creatures just by virtue of, of having made all things, imagine now how present he is to all creatures, having become a created man, having become 
dust, having become flesh and blood in Jesus, and having spanned not just earth and heaven, but heaven and the grave, and having gathered us up, taking us with him so that we are present to him, he is present to us, and he really, um, by his ascension into heaven, does not become more distant from us, but becomes closer to us, because now heaven and earth are united in Jesus Christ. In him all things are united. And so the four creatures around the throne and the cherubim and the seraphim are united with those who believe in Jesus. And this is why we say things like, um, and at, at Holy Communion, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we sing your praise and join their unending hymn. We sing with the angels because we're united with them around the presence of Jesus Christ here in this Holy Supper. You have continual access to that as a Christian, continual access to that as a believer, and therefore invites you to look upon creation with a sacramental perspective, seeing that creation is not God, but God is present to this creation. He's present in this creation to work for you. And whenever you come across something that doubts it, or that casts you into fear about that on that point, then you flee from the Father to the Son. You go to Christ crucified, and there you find that he directs you to his word, to his sacraments, to his body and blood on the altar, and says, there is where you find the certainty and the assurance that indeed I am near you and I am at work for you in this life. Because look, I'm even there in your bread and wine. This is why Martin Luther at one point said, if you ever need assurance and strength in your faith, don't go to the cross. The cross is in the past. Don't go to the cross the way some Christians talk and kneel at the cross. Where are you going to do that? Where's the cross? Don't see it. Christ is risen. Instead, instead of doing some mental exercise up here, go to the altar where his word is, where his body and blood are. Go to the altar and bow your heart there and, and bend your knee there and receive him there. There you have the assurance he is for you because he says it, and to confirm and prove it, he even gives you his own body and blood, the very body and blood that overcame death and the grave, the body and blood in which all things are united. Remember, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak, and that is why Jesus came to raise the flesh, because the sick are the ones who need a physician, so if the flesh is weak, it is for the flesh Christ especially came because our flesh, weakened by sin, needed to be redeemed, and he now has done that, and he transforms it by his presence, even as he'll transform you, knock your socks off, when he raises you from the dead. Peace be with you. Oh, the two things. The two things are, uh, one, the presence will be the theme of our preaching in Advent. On Sundays, we'll be doing a sermon series on the presence for the four Sundays in Advent, beginning November 29th. Also on November 29th, Chaplain Pinzel. Uh, our former associate pastor here at Zion, who now is serving in the uh, Naval Corps of Chaplains, has been called by uh, the people of Zion to serve as our deployed chaplain. Deployed chaplain simply means we recognize him as having a continuing relationship here at Zion as someone who serves in the military and in a deployed fashion, not on staff here, not part of the staff here, but in a deployed fashion uh, elsewhere. And so we rejoice in that continuing relationship. And on November 29th, he will be with us for our sending service in which we send him into that new calling. In preparation for that, next week, November 15th, he will be leading this study. And it might be a little different from what we've been doing. He will be leading this study from his remote location in Rhode Island, where he has been training. And, um, and it'll be good to see him again. So be sure to tune in, as it were, next week. For that study with Pastor Pinzel, Chaplain Pinzel, our deployed chaplain here at Zion. Okay, that's all. Peace be with you.